Well, when I was about seven or eight, I think my first uh, experience of seeing like rock music on was on TV when I saw the Beatles. And then, you know, just being a kid, you know, that really inspired me to want to play the guitar. And, um, you know, there was another very popular TV show at the time that I was into called The Monkees. And uh, I used to love that show. I loved Mike Nesmith's guitar playing and the songwriting was really, really cool. So. That was kind of the early stages or uh, introduction to, to rock or pop music that really got me into wanting to play guitar. So my mom uh, bought me a little three-quarter size Harmony acoustic guitar and she had a teacher that would come to the house and I wanted to learn how to play songs but he would not only teach me the guitar but he taught me how to sing and play the songs together which I think maybe was the early stages of me playing guitar and singing. It was like song, songwriting lessons and singing and playing guitar lessons more than guitar. The guitar instruction was very basic. So, um, you know, I, I, I did that for a while, a number of years, and learned the basic chords. And I remember when I got into like, you know, maybe middle school, junior high is what we called it in Philadelphia. Um, I started hearing a, a, a different sound from the Beatles or the Monkees and it was like Led Zeppelin and Aerosmith and um, once I heard that and the Rolling Stones, you know, I remember hearing Jumpin' Jack Flash and Brown Sugar and um, you know that from that point on and all through like my high school years, you know, it's just that's all I wanted to do. I wanted to learn how to play electric guitar and I, uh, I bought an Ibanez electric guitar, um, it was one of my first Les Pauls, it was like a Les Paul copy. Um, I earned the money for that myself and uh, the first Gibson that I got was it was like the golden ring for me. You know my mom bribed me to get out of school with with this guitar that I saw in a local music shop and it was a 78 Gibson custom and uh, the deal was if I got my diploma because I wanted to go join a touring band at that point and I had some offers from just like cover bands you know local cover bands and I wanted to kind of just get on with the music thing, so she, uh, she brought me to stay in school. And uh, so, you know, from, the, from that point, like most guitarists, pretty much self-taught on the electric, and you know, I love Jimmy Page, and I just try to cop his riffs and learn how to do that vibrato and, and all that. And what I didn't realize what I was learning how to do was play blues, because I didn't know what he was doing was called blues. And, and once I figured that out, I started to delve back into blues, so that became a big part of my background too. Um, and that was a, a cool thing to be able to interpret, you know, what your heroes learn from in your own way too, and kind of combine the two. But basically, you know, uh, from high school years on, I was putting cover bands together, and that's where I learned how to play and sing and write songs and played the Jersey club scene pretty heavily with a lot of different bands. You know, there was this huge scene in South Jersey. It was all covered clubs, but there was a cover club on every corner because the drinking age was 18. So they were packed nightly. And uh, you know, you would work five nights a week, five sets a night. And I started doing that when I was in high school. Uh, I got on a work study program where I'd go home at noon and go to bed and then go out to play clubs with cover bands until get home at three or four o'clock in the morning and then drag myself to school the next day. So that was like my early uh, wood shedding and cutting teeth. And eventually got, you know, tired of that scene. I, I started to wonder why, uh, you know, Led Zeppelin and the Stones and Rod Stewart got to make records and obviously it's because they had their own songs. And uh, that's when I wanted to get out of the club scene and the cover scene and start writing songs. And, and that's what I did for a number of years. And, that eventually led to putting Cinderella together. My first exposure to real blues, I was probably about 17 years old and, and there was a drummer in uh, one of the cover bands that I was playing with who was uh, an older cat and he gave me B.B. King live at the Regal and we, we sat down and we were listening to the record and I, I looked at him and I said, that guy sounds like Jimmy Page. And he said, well, no, actually it's the other way around. And then, you know, that's when the light bulb went off and I was like, oh, okay, so. He said, you know, the blues was an influence of Jimmy Page, and that's where I, you know, realized that. And then I started delving back into, obviously, I started listening to the B.B. King, because I liked his playing, but also Muddy Waters and Johnny Winter and all that, you know, amazing slide work that he did, and Elmore James, 
another really cool blues with the electric slide. I love the Delta sound. Um, and even going as far back as the, you know, acoustic, very broken down Robert Johnson and Sun House stuff, you know, I love. So, and uh, I'm, I'm glad that he gave me that record because it, it, I think it, I learned a lot from being able to go back and listen to and interpret and learn from what the people who inspired me did. You know, and I think it gives you a greater understanding of music. So, when I got into rock after I heard the Stones, you know, at an early age and started playing electric guitar, you know, they became my heroes and, you know, my friends and everyone, you know, that wanted to play an instrument, wanted to emulate that. And, you know, I grew up on the music of the late 60s and the 70s, which is, you know, you're talking Janis Joplin and Rod Stewart and Bad Company and Free and. Joe Walsh and the James Gang, and I could go on and on. The Eagles, to Fleetwood Mac, to Hart, to Led Zeppelin, to the Rolling Stones. It was an incredible, incredibly creative time for music. And not only did those artists influence uh, you in a musical way, but they influenced you image-wise. You wanted to be like them, so you would start to emulate them. And uh, you know, all my heroes were pretty flashy. I loved Mick Jagger and Keith Richards and. They were cool and had a touch of glam vibe to them, and Janis Joplin did, and Aerosmith did, and you know, so you learn in the same way in in a fashion sense that you do in your music sense. And I think when Cinderella came around, and we were in part of the decade in the '80s where so much importance was placed on the visual because of MTV, I think. The over-the-top look that developed in the 80s was a result of us wanting to take our heroes to a whole nother fucking level. And the 80s was all about excess. And you know, and I and I think that it was that's what it was about, you know, and I think that, you know, probably most of my buddies from those bands, you know, would, would tell you the same thing. You know, it came from that glam hard rock you know imagery of the 60s and the 70s and trying to take it somewhere new, because now all of a sudden there was this meet this new visual thing called MTV where it was as much about the visual as it was about the music so um, you know I think that every, the whole decade got caught up in that and not just in the rock scene but I mean you look at the pop scene from Cyndi Lauper to Boy George to Madonna to you know everything in the 80s was fucking over the top and it was cool it was a great decade there was this really cool photographer that we met um, called, uh, what's his name again? Mark Weiss, that's right. One of my very best buddies. And uh, he, shot, uh, he shot the cover for Night Songs for us. And uh, it was uh, shot in the historic district of Philadelphia, which is where we were from. And I believe that structure we were standing in was called Headhouse Square, is that right? I, I, I may have that wrong, it's been a long time. My memory is, is starting to go too. But the most interesting thing that I remember about that shoot was the album was called Night Songs and Mark scheduled the shoot for daytime. And I kept saying to him, that's not going to look right. And he said, I shoot day for night. And I don't know what the fuck that meant. <laughs> <laughs> And I just trusted him, because I kind of liked this guy right off the bat. I thought he was a straight up cat. And uh, sure enough, when we got the pictures back, it looked like it was nighttime. So Mark Weiss is a fucking genius. <laughs>